Hello again. This week we're doing or having a look at larger Sheffield plate. You may remember a month ago we looked at the Sheffield plate flatware, which was quite popular. We're not going to do the whole history of Sheffield plate. Impossible in any number of uh, videos to do that. But I just want to look at a few pieces and talk you through them. And uh, um, some of these things I've forgotten I had, uh, unfortunately. So they haven't had a clean. That I don't think this has had a polish for... 15 years so do excuse me I tried to clean some of it but my fingers hurt and uh, after half an hour I gave up I'll be quite honest about that um, we're going to look at things chronologically so this is the earliest bit of Sheffield plate that I can show you the whole process was invented in 1742 by Thomas Bolsover in Sheffield and to be clear about what it is if you don't know I'm sure most of you do it's the fusing of a large piece of copper to a smaller piece of silver. And because both of those metals share basically the same physical properties, you can solder them together and you can roll them out into a workable sheet and it doesn't split or come apart. Um, Bolsover discovered this and over the next 10 to 15 years, a few items, small items of Sheffield plate, are made um, and then it really takes off. It is the first real substitute to silver that you get in the 18th century. There are other materials that silvered brass. That's incredibly rare. The fact that very little of it survives today shows you how expensive and difficult it was to make French plated objects, um, which is a silver leaf process uh, on brass onto a finished brass object whereas Sheffield plate you're machine rolling out sheets and sheets of the fused plate either a sandwich of copper and silver or a sandwich of silver copper and silver depending on the object that was being made in this case the body of this coffee pot this early coffee pot is a is a fused plate silver copper and silver because you're going to see the inside now let's look at the inside here if i get it in the right light and i turn it you can see that rippled effect here and that is because and this is something you've got to appreciate about sheffield plate <clears throat> as much work if not more went into making this as its silver equivalent. All of this body is hand raised from sheet, just as it would have been with a silver coffee pot. It is meticulous, hundreds and hundreds of small hammer marks rising and forming the shape of the body. That's all hand raised. May not be silver, may be Sheffield plate, but it's all hand raised and the time it took to do that is the same as it took to do it on a silver example. Um, also, you've got to remember that every part of this is made from a sheet. You can't cast Sheffield plate. Um, with later electro plate, that's not a problem. You can cast a base metal into various forms, fittings, little finials, spouts, whatever. And the plating is the last thing you do. With a piece of Sheffield plate, the plating is the first process. The fusing of that copper and silver together and rolling into a sheet. Everything that happens from that point on, in terms of construction, you are going to see. If there's a join, you are going to see it. If there's an edge, a cut edge, you are going to see it. Because there is no final plating of the material. So they have to be ingenious and clever about how... They construct things and they have to find compromises to when objects or parts of an object need to be cast. So in the case of this spout, which would be cast in two pieces where it's silver and soldered together and then joined on, it has to be stamped out of that sheet silver in two pieces, but similarly soldered and joined together and attached to the body. So you do get... If you breathe on an object, you can see a line running down all there. <clears throat> you can see, I think, noticeably here. <clears throat> and that's why there's a lot of decoration beading on that line to take your eye away from it. So the design, it's all ingenuity. Here with the finial, again, this little pinecone finial, 
that would be very easy to cast in silver. With Sheffield plate, you've got a headache. So what you do, you die stamp each section in halves, you solder them together, and often, because that is solid, that's infilled with lead to give it form and structure and strength. And there is actually a lead repair here. Often when Sheffield plate gets damaged, particularly in the 18th or 19th century, it will have just a touch of lead solder because of the lower melting temperature, just to, to stick it all back together. Um, not a problem with objects like that, but I mean, it obviously does reduce the value when you're looking. Uh, the nice thing about this coffee pot you can see here, they often have marks that try to imitate hallmarks of the period. So here, where you'd expect three hallmarks to be visible and actually probably a maker's mark on the base for a coffee pot of the period, they've just got three maker's marks. They haven't bothered about the base. You're not really going to see that. But these are the maker's punch, HT in Gothic, for Henry Tudor. So it's very early for Henry Tudor. It's about 1760, 62, 64. Then he went into partnership with Leader, became Tudor and Leader, and they were one of the biggest firms in Sheffield, early biggest firms, producing all manner of wares. And you've got to remember that when this stuff was made, it was by no means cheap. Um, it was simply a more affordable alternative to silver that at the time looked exactly like silver, and people would not have readily told the difference so if you want to think of it in modern terms it's like buying a cheaper small runabout car rather than a luxury four by four estate so it might be a third cheaper or half the half the money but it was still a serious expenditure so these are important and valuable objects they obviously they have the flaw that they are silver on copper. And if they are polished and polished and polished and polished over the years, as you can see with this, uh, this coffee pot is a prime example of that. The silver layer wears, eventually wears away and you see the copper from below. This is often known as bleeding. And it, whilst it's very acceptable on uh, the foot here, you can see the higher points of this stamp decoration and the edges, you've got the copper showing through. It's a bit more serious when you get that. Um, but these are these are extremely good value at the moment, these early pieces of Sheffield Plate, if you can find them. They were, when I was uh, first picked this up 20 or 30 years ago, they were much more valuable and sought after and expensive, which is quite ridiculous. So that is the 1760s. Which is about the earliest you get the, the big manufacture of objects. Now we'll move on just slightly later into about 1765, maybe touching the 1770s, mid 1760s to this. This is fantastic. Uh, this is a really wonderful tankard. Uh, all the rarer because it's marked profu profusely this time. We have the maker's mark four times. See if we can, there, you see it when I breathe on it. And actually three times on the cover, top of the cover. Which you never get with silver, apart from a handful of Newcastle tankards that have a single standard mark on the top there. But um, this is by John Hoyland, again of Sheffield. Almost all of this early stuff is made in Sheffield. Latterly, areas like Birmingham start producing it, but almost always Sheffield. And again, this is fused plate, Sheffield plate, and you've got all of those beautiful hammer marks inside. And can you see that sort of discoloration there? That's the seam. And again, where is that seam? Just where the handle joins. So when you're looking at any vessel of Sheffield plate, any sort of piece of hollow ware that's got a handle, you immediately look for that seam there. And if you huff on it, that can take the glare off and turn it. And I can see, I don't think you'll be able to see it because it's extremely well done. But again, it will have that little tooth. The coffee pot had it as well. In early Sheffield plate, when they join the two plates together, rather than having just edges abutting like that, that can come apart, they leave little 
little flaps of, of metal that sort of go over one another like that. Not all the way up and down, but it, at intervals. And that just gives it a bit more strength. So when you look at that line, it goes down and then it pops out like a little tooth, then goes down and might pop, pop out the other way where they've overlapped. And you'll see that on the inside too. But again, all hand raised. The hours and days it took to raise a vessel like this in silver, it took hours and days to raise it in Sheffield plate. Um, again, there have to be concessions for things like the thumb piece. That might actually be stamped out of double-sided sheet and then they've just soldered an edge all the way round it. Uh, and again, this decorative part here that you get on silver tankards, which would be cast, that will be stamped out of sheet silver and probably lead filled again to give it strength so it doesn't buckle or, or push in. So they'll often, a stamped border on early Sheffield plate or stamped element that's got to be substantial will often have a lead in fill underneath it before it's soldered on. Another feature, another rare feature of this is fabulous coat of arms. Look at that armorial. But again, you've got a problem. On a piece of silver, this would all be engraved. Now, of course, engraving means cutting through the silver and you can show the copper below and the illusion is shattered. So all of this border, these flowers and scrolls, all of that is chased, hand chased, flat chased. So that's just pushing the metal forwards and back uh, with a little engraver and a hammer, tapping away and making the indentations so no metal is removed. Uh, but the coat of arms is too fine. Let's see if we can breathe on this. Too fine and intricate, that has to be engraved. Now, th this can be an indicator of date for Sheffield Plate. On later pieces, probably after about 1790 um, to 1800, a lot of manufacturers, knowing there's going to be a crest or a coat of arms, will let in a pure piece of silver into the surface of the vessel and have that rubbed in so it will be thicker, that thicker area to allow for that engraving to take place. On the earlier pieces, they hadn't thought of that. So what they do is they get the engravers, very skilled engravers, to engrave it. But rather than cutting straight into the surface and going deep, they teach them to engrave at an angle. So they're going at 45 degrees. They're still making a visible line, but they're not pushing all the way through the silver surface. Sometimes it survives like this, rarely, in perfect condition. A lot of the time it won't. And you'll actually see lots of wear and it'll come away and you'll see copper all the way through it. Uh, it was a bit hit and miss, but it's what happens on the earlier pieces. And again, this is remarkable because all of this plating is original. If you electroplate a piece of old Sheffield plate because it's down to bare copper or there's wear or whatever, you kill it. Um, so never, ever do that. Although... Pieces like this in near original state are absolute hen's teeth. Now, I'm going to stop it there because we've gone on for a while, but I'll see you in a second in part two.